Hi, I'm Lindsay. I saw, saw my uh, co-organizer, uh, Mick uh, Michael, slip in just a second ago. We've got Mick here as a backup in case my connection drops out. Um, yeah, welcome to the uh, to the Sydney DevOps Meetup, the special event. Um, just before we kick off, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country throughout Australia, uh, which in my case is the Gurringai people. Uh, I want to recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. Uh, we pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So uh, as I said just before, welcome to this uh, very special event. Uh, lovely to have you all here. Uh, we've got a very special guest with us tonight. Um, and before we go into that, uh, I just want to just do a quick recap of the code of conduct as well. Um, so DevOps Sydney is uh, dedicated to providing a harassment-free meetup experience. We don't tolerate harassment of, uh, of anybody, uh, any meetup participant in any form. So we expect that all communication here should be appropriate for a professional audience. Uh, and remember that harassment is sexist, uh, racist, or exclusionary jokes are not appropriate here. Um, and because we're doing this all virtually, uh, it's really easy for me to kick you out. We haven't had any uh, cases where I've needed to do that, but um, it is there just in case we need to. And if uh, you're looking for a contact person, uh, in case you're having any issues, feel free to DM me through uh, either Meetup or here in the Zoom right now. All right, so tonight's agenda, it's a little bit uh, a little bit different to how we've been doing them uh, for the last couple of months. So we're just diving straight into this interview that you're hearing right now. We're gonna do the uh, main talk with Manuel, and then we're gonna have a bit of Q&A at the end. Um, we aim to uh, wrap up uh, in you know, about 60 minutes from now. So the main talk uh, tonight is for Manuel, uh, Manuel Pace. We've got avoiding the CICD monolith with team interactions and evolutions. Uh, Manuel is definitely one of the uh, leading voices in the DevOps space uh, when it comes to the culture side of things. And uh, when he popped up and, and offered to speak at the meetup, uh, there is absolutely no way that I would turn that down. So uh, thank you very much, Manuel, for, for being here with us tonight. Uh, Manuel is joining us all the way from Lisbon in per uh, Portugal. So um, we have a, a truly international meetup and I'm sure that there are, uh, there are folks from elsewhere. Actually, I'm, I'm based in Madrid, even though I'm from Lisbon. <laughs> Excellent. So, Manuel's joining us from Pretty Madrid. Um, you know, Madrid, Lisbon, they're basically the same thing, right? It's Europe. It's, it's over there. It's the same distance, um, yeah. That's right. That's right. Uh, you're, like, the nice thing about Lisbon is that from Sydney, if you were to, like, turn the earth into a sandwich and you yeah. put a slice of bread on Sydney and a slice of bread <laughs> on Lisbon, it, it would almost match up perfectly. Uh, but now that, now that I know you that know. you're in Madrid... It, I, I, I can't tell that fact anymore, so that's a shame. Well, you burst my bubble memoir. All right. So uh, before we dive into the talk, I uh, just want to do a quick, uh, quick shout out here. Who is a first timer tonight? Feel free to use the, uh, uh, the little reactions in, uh, in Zoom or put up your hand if you, uh, if you uh, want to enable your video. I'll just drop it in the chat. It's up to you. There we go. There's a few smiley faces and reactions, and that's lovely to have you here at first timers. Um, and I was going to ask how far away folks have come from. Manuel, you do not get to answer this question uh, because you are probably the clear winner. But I wonder if there is actually anybody from Portugal that is joining us today, because that would probably be the first part away from us right now. Look at all the countries in chat. Germany, Israel, Paris, Portugal, uh, where else? NZ, the stacks. Amazing. Well, it is lovely to have all of you here popping up and uh, telling us where you're coming from. So lovely to have such an international audience. Well, that is really lovely to see. Well, thank you for being here and uh, welcome to the Sydney DevOps Meetup. We are just going to dive straight into it then uh, with Manuel talking about avoiding the CICD monolith with team interactions and evolutions. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and hand over to him. Thank you, Lindsay. So you should be seeing my screen now. We can see that just fine. Okay. So first of all, it's a pleasure to be here and um, that uh, you accepted my offered to give a talk. Um, it's kind of, it's quite humbling to see this meetup has been running since 2010. I think my recollection, recollection of uh, hearing about DevOps is 2011. <laughs> so it's, um, I've actually started a meetup in, in Lisbon in 2016. Um, so it's really a pleasure to, to, to be joining you. 
Um, so this talk, let's go get into it, is about avoiding CI-CD monolith with team topologies. So who am I? I'm an independent IT organizational consultant trainer. I've had different roles. My background is in computer science. I have different roles throughout my career. Um, and in the last five years, mostly consulting around DevOps, continuous delivery, and coming up with all this sort of issues that we would see around teams and, and how they sometimes had lack of clarity, how, what is their role uh, in terms of their relationship with other teams, how do they interact. Um, and so that's how the book Team Topologies came about that me and Matthew Skelton co-wrote mostly from that consulting experience, also a lot of research and seeing what other organizations were doing. Um, so the book was published about a year ago. It's from IT Revolution. So if you've, you've probably heard of Phoenix Project, DevOps Handbook, now the Unicorn Project, they're all from the same publisher. Uh, so in very good company, Accelerate book as well. Um, and so one of the key um, aspects of, of foundations of team topology is the, the Conway's law, right? So the Mel Conway stated this in 1968. So it's been a while. Um, that any organization that designs a system defined broadly will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. So to put this uh, more simply, uh, <laughs> I like the definition from Ruth Mellon. She says, if you have the architecture of the system and the architecture of the organization are at odds, if they're very different, the architecture of the organization wins. So there's this strong influence from the way we set up our teams and how they um, interact and what are the communication paths between teams uh, on the, the architecture that actually emerges in our systems, uh, not what we kind of idealize, but what actually then turns out. Um, and so whatever kind of gaps or barriers there are between teams, they're going to likely show up in, in the architecture of the system. So this Conway's law got a lot of traction when microservices became um, trendy in uh, a few years, um, several years ago. And so it's got a lot of more attention. And there have, there have been studies in different industries that show that this effect, you know, sh um, is visible, not just in, in, in software, but even um, manufacturing and other industries. And so how do, what does Conway's law have to do with continuous delivery? Um, well, just Humble has been telling us for years, right? That uh, if your architecture doesn't fundamentally support continuous delivery, um, then you're going nowhere, he said, perhaps that's a bit extreme, but it's a strong blocker to achieving faster flow, to having your um, pipelines and your kind of delivery. Um, if you don't have the architecture that supports it with independent um, streams and independent um, parts of your system that can go through the, the pipelines independently, then we're still going to have a lot of um, obstacles to actually achieving faster flow, um, getting um, better at delivery and uh, feedback and all these things we're trying to achieve with continuous delivery. So if we have something that looks like this, um, sometimes even the monolith might not be um, kind of at the application level we might have a monolith where even we might have microservices, but then we need to test them all together in the same environment and we want to, we need to deploy them all together. Then that's still the monolith. It's just later in the life cycle. Um, and so if, if we have something like this is actually based on um, some work that um, we did some consulting work um, where this organization had, okay, if, do, do you see four teams represented here or four, uh, flows, but there are actually about 20. Um, each of them can develop and test in isolation, but then to actually build the, the application and uh, deploy, you need to bring them all together. So it's, we're not really having um, the benefits that we're expecting. It also it becomes very difficult to diagnose when there's an actual problem um, in, the, in the deployment, for example, where where this problem come from? What are what are the causes of this uh, problem? And so what we're trying to do effectively is not just have those deployment pipelines, but actually have the independence of the different 
uh, streams of work, right? So we, we're trying to split off. Uh, we might start with uh, one or two to get uh, this independent route to life so that we have the more ownership by the teams that are the owners of that part of the system that they can actually build, test and, and deploy, right? And so that over time, our kind of target would be to have this sort of independence. Um, effectively, systems like microservices uh, or architectural styles like microservices are supposedly trying to help us achieve this sort of thing. So when we have this sort of monolith that we're seeing, um, likely the teams that are working on this are going to need some help to actually achieve these more independent uh, flows of, of change. Um, and so one ad possibility is to actually, if we're in that sort of scenario, that we start having enabling teams. So an enabling team would be a team of experts around some domain, in this case, uh, continuous delivery or actual uh, around architecture. So if we already have architecture team, they could change or shift a little bit the way they work to actually um, work on the ground with this, what we call stream aligned teams. For the moment, you can, you know, you can think of them as your development teams or application teams, hopefully more towards build and run teams with that kind of ownership. Um, but whatever types of teams you have, then the enabling teams should be able to help by having a small team of experts around architecture, continuous delivery, to understand what are the gaps in our, uh, in our development teams or streamlined teams, what is preventing them from actually being able to get more decoupling in the system and at the same time decoupling between the teams. Um, and so these enabling teams will work in, in um, in a way that they are kind of teachers, they're mentors, they're facilitating knowledge, they're helping the, those teams detect their kind of gaps. You know, what are the things that you might need to help with that you need to understand to actually be able to do that kind of decoupling work. Um, and so at the, at the kind of initial level, if you have that sort of monolith uh, and that kind of coupling where you see that, well, it's very difficult for any one team to deploy changes independently, um, there's always all these sort of dependencies with other teams, then uh, we likely need to invest in that, right? So the enabling team is a sort of supporting team that is going to help the, your streamlined teams or application teams to understand the things that are going to help them get more um, independent. And so the way the enabling teams tend to work is through facilitation. Uh, so uh, those can be training workshops or creating video tutorials, um, helping with framework selection and tooling. So it, ideally these teams have also the bandwidth to, to, to do this. Um, pairing on examples with, with your stream teams and guidance, etc. So it's a very much kind of a mentoring coaching approach. It's not kind of ivory tower where we just give you some some guidance and now you go and, and, and you should go and follow because those those teams, those stream teams, application teams, they're often um, already um, over, um, um, they're already, already overloaded with, with the work they have to do and, and the features they have to deliver. So it's not very realistic to expect these teams to just find the time to, to learn all the stuff and to um, investigate what are the useful tools or whatever they need um, to improve their their work. So we they need they need this sort of help. Um, and so this is why I, I say we need a more team centric approach for sustainable uh, CICD, not so much tool centric. Um, because of Conway's law and because teams are being pulled in many directions and they're being asked to do a lot of things, they need uh, kind of supporting. We need to think of what people call teams of teams, a team of teams. We need to think about the ecosystem of teams we need to actually get better at continuous delivery, get better at um, um, architecture, more independent um, streams, more you know, faster delivery. All those things means require uh, an ecosystem of teams. It's not just about pushing each of the, the streamlined teams, application teams to, to do more. That's not very um, realistic. Um, and Conway's law also applies on the CI/CD um, 
system itself. So the, there's a very interesting and funny article from um, Forest Brazil from um, Cloud Guru where he's talking about different patterns and uh, well anti patterns where he sees the the application of Conway's law. So um, I recommend that. And if you look at the third one, the blob in particular, um, what he's saying is that if, for example, you have a centralized team that takes care of your CI/CD system, um, this system can actually work very differently, can help some teams that are closer to those central team, that central team has a better understanding of what these uh, teams need. And it might not work so great for other teams that are further away, don't have a, uh, such a, a direct relationship with a centralized team. And so it's not, it doesn't matter which tools you have, because if the understanding of um, and the communication paths are different, then this is going to have likely a different um, impact and different benefits for different teams. In some cases, it might actually negatively affect some teams. If we say, well, you need to use our kind of centralized system and we haven't really understood what some of the teams uh, need and their expectations, their understanding is, then uh, we might actually be causing them more problems. And so in a way, centralized versus decentralized, where you'd say, well, every team could own their, their CI/CD um, and their uh, tooling and their infrastructure and so on. Um, you know, it's not that, to me, it's not one versus the other, is finding what it, where is the, the, the right kind of balance and evolving that over time. Because effectively there are anti-patterns on both sides, right? Um, when we have this centralized CI/CD teams, um, some of the problems we see is we tend to, to try to make upfront decisions on requirements for continuous delivery so that we can have, you know, uh, we try to understand all the requirements and then build a system uh, and then uh, we, we think we're, we're done. Um, while typically these requirements are going to evolve over time. As teams get more familiar, get, they get uh, better at continuous delivery, they're going to have more specific uh, needs. Um, and we're trying to sometimes standardize, say, well, this is the right thing for everyone in the organization. Um, that might not be the case, um, especially the larger the organization and the, the more teams there are, um, which we can't just assume that this is going to be work for, for all of them. When there's a strong focus on, uh, on building homegrown tools for, the, for their CI/CD system, um, over time these tools tend to diverge or at least not easily support emerging new practices um, around continuous delivery. And so that's also um, some of another issue that we tend to see with these centralized systems. Um, and on the other hand, decentralized CI/CD, of course. Uh, there's an issue of it's actually quite a, a considerable amount of work to maintain, to scale, to make sure the CI/CD system um, is is stable, is resilient. So, if we leave it up to each team to do that, then typically the the those kind of aspects are going to be uh, negatively affected over time. And so you might see the, the the tool chain breaks, and then it takes several days until we're able to fix it or um, you know, we know that it, we're using kind of old ways, um, old, old, you know, old, old tools, or we're using things that are not really uh, adequate anymore, but we don't have time to, to change it and replace it and evolve it. Um, so if, if the tool chain integration sometimes is fragile and, and you have frequent problems, it's hard to diagnose what actually happened. Um, and so also the evolution, like I said, of the tooling might be, might be slow. Um, and for many teams, especially um, when continuous delivery came about in the years that followed, uh, many teams uh, adopted some tool, useful tooling. They started creating their pipelines and, and that was helpful, but it kind of didn't scale very well. And uh, over time it became um, a bit of a, of a burden and actually slowing down th those teams compared to others. And so what, in my opinion, what we really need to do is clarify the, the boundaries uh, of CI/CD uh, and responsibilities. So um, we're trying to help teams, application teams, streamline teams deliver faster, right? So it makes sense that some 
of the concerns of the CICD system are in, in a sort of centralized team um, or a platform team. We're going to talk about that uh, in a bit. So the concerns about scaling and, you know, making sure the tooling is, is up to date and that we um, uh, evolve it on a, on a continuous basis. Perhaps all that makes sense in a more of centralized approach. Um, but then the kind of the boundaries get blurry around, you know, who owns the pipeline definition, uh, who owns the, the, um, the design of these pipelines, et cetera. Um, so what we want to keep in mind is we're trying to help those streamline teams, help the application teams be able to do more uh, with less to worry about, right? So we should be looking at what the, the, bound, the right boundary is. Um, effectively, we're, we're trying to encourage both, you know, sharing group practices and, and technology, which um, we might achieve with the right kind of setup in, in a more centralized approach um, so that different teams can learn and, and get, um, you know, use the available technology and get better at some practices, learn new practices. Um, so we need kind of cross team pollination, if you like, in a way. Uh, but you also want each team to have autonomy and ownership and, and not feel like, well, this is something I'm being forced to use that is not really helping me or is causing me uh, problems. Um, so we kind of need a, a worldview that accepts this reality that we can't just impose, you know, a one size fits all, but at the same time, we, we want to share um, good practice and technology. Um, and so again, the, the Topologies can help. Uh, we expect that if we are uh, looking at the, the team topologies, they can help because they bring this clarity on uh, what different teams we might have and what is their purpose. And so um, besides the enabling teams, we might also have, we, or we usually have uh, modern platform teams that are also important to reduce the, the cognitive load of streamlined teams. Um, and so these platform teams would, would then be uh, part of the services they provide would likely be around CI CD. So that's a pattern we see now uh, very often. But again, it's the way we approach that and how we, we think in terms of supporting teams then um, makes a difference. So I mentioned cognitive load uh, a couple of times. So it's um, important to actually define it uh, is the total amount of mental effort being used in the working memory. Um, so this is was defined by John Sweller, he's a psychologist. Um, and so we can use this idea at the team level as well. What is the team cognitive load? What is their, how much of their capacity is being, uh, is being used? And the cognitive load has three different types. Intrinsic cognitive load has to do mostly with um, the skills that we need to do our day-to-day -day job. Um, so if I'm a Java programmer, I need to know Java, the Java syntax, and I need to know how to compile and all these, all these things. Um, extraneous cognitive load has everything to do with kind of the mechanics, the, the mechanisms we need to uh, deliver the work. And, uh, you know, how do I deploy my application? How do I run the tests? How do I uh, diagnose a problem? All these sorts of things are kind of extraneous cognitive load. If we have to put our um, working memory to to do these things and to remember and to um, and, and to every time kind of uh, that we need to do it again, it takes up effort and it's extraneous cognitive load. And the germain is everything related to actually the, the business domain, the, the things we're trying to achieve for our customers or for the organization. And so when we look at it like this, we what we really want to do is minimize intrinsic and extraneous cognitive load and so we can maximize germain. So we can have teams, especially the streamlined teams that are focused more on what is the main I work on? What are the things, what, are, what do I need to, to experiment to get our customers to you know, adopt these new features or change their behavior or um, spend more money in our, on our application, whatever it is that is kind of the business goal that we're trying to achieve um, through the software. Um, and so teams actually need more space to understand germane aspects and, and we, need, we want to minimize the others. And so obviously a lot of um, CICD aspects come into the extraneous um, cognitive load um, part. 
And so that's why many organizations have this approach of CICD um, as a platform or as, or as a platform service. Um, but it's not just about, like we're saying, it's not just about, you know, we own the tools and we own the infrastructure. It's actually how do we expose this to teams? How do we make uh, this easy to, to understand and to use for, for our um, streamlined teams so that they don't have to worry about a lot of these aspects uh, themselves? while still understanding what is the value of, of CICD. So it's good to have a, a definition. So Evan Butcher is, is a, maybe some of you have uh, know him, he's a consultant at ThoughtWorks in Australia. Um, normally when I'm talking to people in Europe or in US, maybe they're, they're not familiar. So he wrote this in a blog from um, Martin Fowler and it defines, he defined digital platforms foundation of self-service APIs, tool services, but also knowledge and support arranges a compelling internal product. So there are a lot of aspects here which are a bit foreign to what used to be traditional definitions of a platform or approaches to platform, where we were just looking, well, it's a set of shared services and now we mandate this on all the teams. So he's talking about a very different approach where we look at the platform as a product that means we need to care about adoption of the, pro of the product, of the platform. We need to care about usage, um, reliability, and of course, the self-service pattern is key to allow teams to, be, um, to have still independence and autonomy uh, to do their work without depending on another team to do you know, a lot of tasks in the life cycle for them. Um, but essentially a platform, the way we see it is a, is a curated experience for internal customers. So we're focusing, we need to focus a lot on what is the experience of using the platform? How do we, what are the right abstractions to make it this an, a compelling product internally for our, our teams? Um, and this evolves continuously, right? It's, it doesn't just stop and we say, this is, this is done because our teams are evolving as well. Hopefully their uh, kind of maturity and their understanding around these areas is evolving. And so we're gonna have to uh, evolve the platform as well. Um, so part of this curated experience is providing adequate abstractions um, for whatever service, but in, in this case, we're talking about uh, CICD. Um, so we do want to rely on third parties as much as possible uh, and, and take advantage of the fact that whatever kind of tooling exists in the market, that's probably gonna be um, uh, more up to date with kind of good practices and, and um, good approaches so we want to leverage that what we want to focus is kind of the what i call the translation layer right what what do we need on top of this third party that will make life easier for our teams um and so these are kind of higher level abstractions that i'm talking about and so for example you might start um you might have teams that are you know starting with kind of simple pipelines with roughly build test deploy um and this might be okay in the beginning for, for, uh, for some teams, but we might want to help them um, and, and get them to actually start thinking about um, other types of, of activities in the pipeline, such as you know, static analysis and kind of um, security tests that we can integrate early on and start kind of um, classifying uh, our tests in, in, in different kind of buckets. So it's not just lumping everything together so we can get faster feedback and we can understand better what are the exact problems that uh, when the, which tests failed. Um, and so we start, we might start with this kind of simple way of uh, just bringing them this awareness and this understanding. Um, but even this at some point is kind of a little bit limited, right? Because um, if we look at continuous delivery, the book, what it says the objective of the deployment pipelines is to eliminate and fit release candidates as early in the process as we can and get feedback on the root cause of failure um, of the, uh, to the team as rapidly as possible. And so when we have this sort of pipeline, it, it's, you know, it gives us feedback, but there's still kind of a, often a kind of, um, a long loop of, you know, let's, now we need to understand which part of the pipelines fail, look at which, um, why that, that activity failed, and then uh, try to, to diagnose and, and see what exactly happened. And we're gonna um, 
try to, to run tests that failed again in, in isolation or whatever we're going to do. It, it's kind of uh, still a little bit lengthy process. Um, even though we have a more kind of uh, evolved pipeline, we have more kind of um, specific activities and, and controls uh, around the, the quality of this release candidate, if you like, it's still kind of something that can be improved. So perhaps we could have kind of an ideal ideal abstraction would be a sort of declarative pipeline, let's say, where we could say, um, well, fail the pipeline if, you know, obviously test fails, but also if the uh, test coverage decreases or the health of the code decreases, um, if there are new vulnerabilities, if the, the time to build goes over 10 minutes or the whole pipeline goes over an hour because we want to make sure we keep feedback um, as fast as possible. So those numbers actually are kind of based on what uh, Dave Farley talks about in terms of what would be a reasonably uh, fast feedback loop. So something like this could be kind of our ideal abstraction, right? It's maybe not uh, uh, realistic to start with, but this could be perhaps our kind of goal that teams would be able to not know much about the actual creation of the pipelines and, and, and running the pipelines, they would just be able to say, this is the criteria that I want uh, before my release candidate can go uh, and be deployed in, in, in production or, or staging, if that's what you, what you do. Um, so we can have this sort of ideal abstraction that's, uh, like I said, uh, this is not something uh, that you would get to uh, in, in, in a short period of time, but it's something that perhaps you're trying to, you would see as kind of what would be um, reducing the, the, the cognitive load uh, uh, for the streamlined teams um, to some extreme. And so if we would have that, then uh, if we would say, well, almost the pipeline can be created uh, automatically based on the criteria that you have, then um, if the pipeline is green, then this gives us a lot of confidence around the, kind of this sort of release criteria, right? We know all of these things are, are true. Um, and if the pipeline fails, then it might help us get a faster diagnose of uh, what actually was the problem. And so, you know, it could be that, well, the pipeline stopped in security tests, but it was actually because the execution was going over one hour. And so we said we want to stop the pipeline then. Um, so I'm talking about this as just kind of trying to illustrate what could be different sorts of abstractions that we could be thinking about. It doesn't mean that you, you should, uh, you need to aim for this. Uh, perhaps this is kind of uh, the ideal, but what, what we're trying to do is say, what can we have in, in our sort of platform and what is the CI/CD service and the kind of boundaries um, and the, the um, what is in the platform versus what is the responsibility of the development teams so that we can reduce the cognitive load of those teams. Um, and that's what's going to help them then accelerate and be able to do things faster and deliver that sort of business value faster without having to um, care and worry about so, uh, too, ma too many details. And so the platform needs to focus a lot on the developer experience right? because our internal teams um, are developers. And so this means, you know, understanding those abstractions, understanding how we might provide the same sort of service in different ways for different teams, perhaps. Um, you know, we have pipeline as code, which is um, obviously very helpful, but perhaps we have some teams that prefer still to use graphical interface. Um, and by the way, these this examples here are just, they're not meant to be um, the same thing. It's just random examples I took. Um, different teams might like, like I said, some teams like pipeline as code, some teams might like the graphical interface. Uh, so how do we, you know, should we be supporting different ways that they want to, to create their pipelines or should we um, uh, make it more standardized? Again, we should understand what is the, the, the value and how those teams want, want to, to use this uh, CI-CD service. And perhaps we can support as a platform team, we can support different approaches, different preferences, because we understand that's gonna help reduce the cognitive load of those teams. 
it might mean that the platform team itself is taking on more cognitive load, right? So if I have to support uh, different ways that, that people can create and define pipelines um, as part of my CI CD service, then that's obviously more a bit more complexity. So it's a trade off that we need to do. We need to decide if it's worthwhile. So another um, interesting example. Um, so a, a bank in the a Dutch bank called ABN AMRO, um, what they do is they actually have in their kind of, I would say, a CI CD um, platform team, and they provide, if you can see, kind of two different sets of of, uh, of tooling, basically to do similar things. But some teams are based on the more of the Jenkins tool set. Other teams are based more on the ZB Labs release tool set. And so for them, it made sense because they're kind of a, a large bank with many um, development teams. It made sense for the, this sort of platform team to take on this extra complexity instead of uh, kind of making everyone use the same tool set because they understood how this was helping uh, different teams in, in different ways. Um, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to be this. It doesn't mean that we have to support all sorts of tooling, but we want to get the right trade-off where we say, okay, if, if we take on that complexity in the platform, what is the, the value? Do we understand the, the value and it, does it make sense? Um, and sometimes it might be the other way around where you say, well, only a few teams, a couple of teams use this different tool set. And so what we actually need to do is help them onboard the, the new um, tool chain, help them understand what are the differences, how, how, what is the kind of migration, how uh, facilitate that and so that we can reduce complexity in the platform. Um, and so again, it's something that evolves. You might start with um, one tool set and then you add another tool set and then over time you realize, oh, actually, if we look at the usage, only a couple of teams use this older tool set, let's get rid of it. Uh, but we need to facilitate the, the transition uh, because in that case, we're actually asking those uh, stream teams or development teams to, in effect, take on temporarily burden of this migration of understanding this new uh, tooling, perhaps some new ways that uh, of working as well. There's also another interesting example recently from Spotify uh, from their engineering. Um, I think they're called developer productivity team, uh, but I see them, you know, from what they said, most kind of a platform team as well. Um, and so what they did, it, what they have is actually, they have this CI CD system called Tingle. I, I suppose underneath they're, they're using some, some other um, known tools, but they, they have this system. And what you see here is that they actually provide different entry points for different teams. So you, you can have uh, templates um, in a portal, which they say offer a kind of zero configuration experience. So for teams that don't have any particular requirements, uh, they can just use these templates and, and get up and running and not, not spend a lot of time around this. They have another kind of entry point to the system where they have custom pipelines, where teams uh, will be able to, if they have specific needs, they can configure those pipelines uh, and uh, to whatever they, they need. And they have uh, another entry point with just providing the API for this Tingle CI CD system where teams can actually build stuff on top of that and um, just use the, 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 the core functionality of the system. Um, and so this really provides a broad range of effectively um, different abstractions that uh, support a broad range of, of teams and, and needs. Um, I assume that they have different teams using these different entry points. Uh, and that's the reason why they, they decided to to have this approach. But it's a very good example of uh, focusing on the developer experience, right? We're not imposing one way of, of doing things. We're actually understanding different teams have different maturity. Some teams have some particular requirements where they might need to, to control more of the pipelines. Others just, you know, they just can just use the templates and they're ready to go and so on. And so that's a, one important approach for platforms. Um, the operational experience as well. So in the CI CD system in particular, we might have a lot of information that will be useful for whoever has that operational role. Um, so in, with streamlined teams, we, we're effectively talking about teams that have built and run responsibility. But even if you have still kind of separation in the organization where some teams are more operational, um, 
whoever that is, that's also a client of the platform and the CI/CD service, right? So we should understand should um, understand what how can we get the information they need to perhaps you know trace incidents in in production to what was the code that was changed or which tests run uh, in that in for that particular uh, version of the code that was deployed and caused a problem. Um, you know, things like we can aggregate information, especially in CI/CD tooling. If you're using, if you're basically integrating um, many different tools, can be very helpful to do things like aggregating the logs from all these different tools, so that it, then it's easy to, if you have a correlation ID, um, for example, the number of your pipeline run, you can then get information around uh, different things that happen for that pipeline run. Um, but whatever it is, we need to focus as well on, on the operational experience. Um, and also the business experience, right? Whatever, I don't want to create a new <laughs> buzzword, but um, uh, BizX or whatever, but understanding who are the possible business users that actually could get benefits from the CI-CD uh, system and service. Um, so we might have people who are product owners. So this is a user persona. So this is um, common in, in, in UX usability um, domain where you create a user persona. We're trying to identify essentially uh, a, a type of customer for our system. Uh, and so we give it a kind of uh, a name and the role to make it more realistic to, for us to identify better with this, with this uh, persona. Um, <clears throat> and we have some we try to understand what are the goals and what the things this this type of uh, uh, person needs to do and what are the problems they might have. And so we might come up and uh, understand better that there are perhaps people who are more kind of business owners or product owners who there's a lot of information that in the CICD pipeline that maybe is useful for them, but they don't have the technical understanding of these tools to actually um, find that information by themselves. And so they might want to know which changes, which features are ready to, to deploy. You know, if we're using feature toggles, you know, what are the features that um, are already available in production so that we can make decisions around whatever that we, we want to do a marketing campaign uh, um, and then turn on the feature or whatever it is that we might want to, to understand from a business perspective on when to actually release the, the changes. Um, and so perhaps we can think about sort of abstraction, which is a notification to these people um, when a certain feature is available. Uh, you know, this is just a, a, a mock, of course, uh, but perhaps the, easy, the easiest way for these people to use the CIC service is to be notified by email when a feature is delivered um, in production um, and also whatever other information is, is relevant. Um, it doesn't have to be this, it might be just, you know, it could be some sort of uh, user interface that makes it easy for, for, for these people to get the information they need. Um, but effectively what I'm trying to say here is that we need to understand these different user personas we might have for our CI/CD services. Um, it's not just developers, even when we talk about developers, uh, you might have very different needs or expectations from a backend developer compared to a mobile developer uh, and, and other people. So understanding the different roles that um, need information or need to use the CI/CD service to actually provide better um, abstractions for them. And effectively, when we're making changes to our CI/CD system and evolving, that we keep these different user personas in mind. We, we keep the user in mind effectively. Um, and finally, I'm getting I get getting to the end, but it's not just about types of teams. It's actually how are we expected to interact? With, uh, how are different teams expected to interact, and when, and and why? Uh, that's something that's often uh, unclear. And so, DevOps sometimes people interpret uh, the idea of, of collaboration, meaning that well, every team can collaborate with every team, right? So we're good. And, and that's very kind of fuzzy and, and not, um, not, not very realistic in, in, in many ways. I think the idea makes sense and, and definitely where DevOps started from, but you know, Lindsay, you can correct me because you, you've been around uh, DevOps uh, longer than me, um, was that idea that in fact we need teams to collaborate and work together on issues that are 
common uh, to them around deployments and infrastructure and all these things. Um, and that was something that at the time you saw a lot of silos where these teams didn't even know each other or didn't even uh, get together at all. So, so that's where the collaboration um, was, was really starting from, but it doesn't mean that we should expect every team in the organization to collaborate with every team. That's, that's not very clear. So we're saying collaboration should be a specific interaction mode where we're saying, yes, two teams are working together, but we should have a defined goal or outcome for this interaction. What are we trying to achieve? So perhaps the platform team and the streamline team are working, collaborating to understand what is this, um, what kind of new feature do you need to be able to um, be more effective and, and uh, have the platform service help you better. And so we might need to um, work together for a period of time. Perhaps we're clarifying the APIs for the CI/CD system, like in the Spotify example. Um, and so we might need want to collaborate on that. Uh, and we set an expectation how long we expect this to, to last. It might be that you know, it takes longer, that's fine, but we have an expectation on how long this interaction is gonna last. Um, and so, like I was saying, for platform teams, we expect one of the core interaction modes to be strong collaboration with the streamlined teams or other types of teams for any sort of new service or evolution, uh, including around CI/CD. So if we're adding new functionality or new features, or if we're creating a, a new service, we should be collaborating uh, strongly in the beginning to actually get very quick feedback from those teams around, is this actually what you will expect from this service, what's gonna help you, um, and you know whatever aspects you, you need to clarify around the API, or if it's a, um, uh, a graphic interface or command line tool, how, you know, how would you want to use this? What are the use cases that we should be covering, et cetera? So we get this sort of fast feedback. Effectively, these teams, the streamlined teams are our customers, right? So like in, we have the advantage compared to, to perhaps the teams focusing on the, the end customers that they might not have quick access to their customers and therefore we have uh, product owners and proxies, but for a platform team, your internal teams are your customers and they are in the same organization. There should be no reason that we can't collaborate with them as long as we set up the right expectations. We can't also just go up to, to, to another team and okay, now can you spend your day with me collaborating? That's probably not gonna work very well. So we set expectations when and for how long and why are we collaborating? Um, and then the other interaction mode that is key for platform teams is X as a service. So this means um, once we've identified what is needed in the platform, we've um, improved the usability of this service, we improved the reliability. At some point we can say um, very much like you have uh, infrastructure as a service from third, third party providers, cloud providers and, and things like this. We can say, well, we have a service that we provide as a team that others can consume and we don't expect them to need our help uh, much anymore. So it should be easy to understand, have adequate documentation um, and reliability as well. Because if we have, if we provide a service and then it often breaks and teams don't know why, you know, is this broken or not? Is someone working on it or not? If we don't, if we have this sort of um, problems happening, then we are going to lose the trust and it's not really X as a service. X as a service, you know, the obvious, the obvious examples are AWS and Google Cloud and so on that um, if something is wrong, you should, you expect to have very quick um, understanding that there's a problem, status pages and all these kind of things. Um, and so the X as a service means we emphasize also the the usability and also the, the um, reliability of this service we're providing. Um, and that might be, like I said, through improving documentation, which is something sometimes we, we, we don't put enough focus that rich documentation is actually part of the developer experience. Um, having good examples, having documentation that is easy to, to understand and read um, is, is important. And kind of, the general pattern then that we see between these interactions is um, initially here to the left, you see there's uh, more collaboration between platform and some of the streamlined teams to understand what do you actually need, uh, how are you gonna uh, 
uh, expose that, create that, and then over time there's more clarity on um, this new service or this new functionality, and we can say, well, that this now is X as a service. We can expose this to everyone else in the organization. Because if you do it too early, what uh, kind of anti-pattern we see with, with many sort of platform teams is that they try to go too fast because they're focusing a lot on uh, let's get more, you know, uh, you know, from a, the, their intention makes sense. We're trying to provide more value by giving more services and providing more sort of um, uh, support around different areas. But when they go too fast, then the services become um, are not ready kind of for mass consumption in the organization. And so they started getting a lot of support requests, a lot of problems, and they end up in this kind of firefighting mode where the, all we do is answer requests and answer, um, look at in, uh, problems with services and, and we don't have any time anymore to actually uh, develop new, new useful services. And so it's important to go through this sort of pattern to make sure when we get to X as a service is really uh, has the right expectations and the kind of, uh, we put in the effort around making it uh, reliable. And also we should expect to collaborate with different teams to validate uh, initially the use cases and abstractions, right? Because if you're only talking to one team or two teams, again, Conway's law comes into, into effect and we're gonna create a service that it meets those needs the needs of those teams very well, but maybe not the needs of other teams. So we need to make sure we we collaborate with a few different teams um, with different maturity as well, if that's the case. Um, and finally, you know, I took a bit long, um, but finally the, the hard problem with, it, with platforms and uh, CICD uh, as a platform as well, um, is having this effective team interactions and, and trust from the consumers of the platform. So make sure you have the time to establish this and, and clarify this uh, sort of team interactions before we focus on building a lot of stuff that yes, in theory it's useful, but we don't actually have the validation and we don't have the, the um, evolution of the services to, to actually uh, provide that value and not get into situations, like I said, that we're mostly firefighting um, and fixing issues. That's it. So quickly, we're also working on a, a workbook, applying some ideas of team topologies for remote teams. Uh, obviously, in the current context, um, some of the techniques are, are can be quite helpful for, again, interactions between different teams that are now remote. Um, there's a bunch of training if you're interested for uh, companies and there's a slide with uh, different resources, um, things that I, I, I mentioned today. I'll make the, I'll publish the slides on SlideShare and I can also send them to, to you, Lindsay, if you, if you wanna share them uh, yourself. And thank you. Um, I know it went a bit long, so, but I'm happy to answer questions. No, no, perfectly on schedule. Thank you very much, Manuel. Uh, Normally, I don't ask people to like unmute their mics to like clap, but I'll just almost do a very loud clapping on it on their behalf. There we go. Um, all right, Thank what you. questions do folks have for Manuel? There were a few in the chat. Chat, yeah. Yeah, let me um, let me just pop one up there. We've got one from uh, Hugo G saying. My team is struggling to distinguish between platform provider and the user's advocate, um, e.g. enforcing safety. Do you have any uh, tips on that one, Manuel? Um, distinguish between platform provider and user's advocate. Um, I think can be the two at the same time, but I think perhaps what you're saying, you know, you we want to provide in the platform certain kind of um, controls and, and if you mentioned safety there. Um, and that's of a question we get very often. Like if we're saying the platform is not mandated that teams can still do uh, their own thing, aren't they kind of going around whatever um, compliance and security that, that we want to have uh, for our services. And so 
when we say that it's not mandated, it doesn't mean that we cannot uh, have an agreed set of uh, criteria and things that uh, all the you know the release candidates must must comply with. Um, and so, if you have certain security aspects and safety that you want to ensure, the streamlined teams that decide not to use the platform, they still need to ensure those those kind of criteria, right? So they need to do it by themselves, but they need to show that uh, it's not that they don't have accountability. They need to show that we're we're um, we're, we're, we're achieving the same that the platform is doing. But that's, and at some point, that's why the, the platform is gonna be more appealing because they'll see, well, I need to do this, but the platform does it for me and I don't have to worry about all this um, uh, tooling for whatever that needs to be done, secure uh, vulnerability scanning, for example, or whatever other kind of controls you have. Um, and so it's a little bit about, I would say, um, promoting your platform services as well, kind of almost advertising to other teams. Uh, there's another quite interesting example recently from a company called HelloFresh. Um, and they were talking about how they brand their services and how they, um, if the internal service of the platform, they, they give it names and brand and stickers. And then the announcements that they make are very kind of pointed at what is the value you're gonna get if you use this, this platform service. Um, and so you need to do a little bit of that sort of uh, promotion as well. Awesome, that's a great answer, thanks. We've got another question in the chat from Christoph. Uh, I'll let you unmute and answer away, well, ask away. Hi, first of all, thanks Manuel for the talk, uh, really interesting. I have a question about the concept of enabling teams because that sounds really intriguing and something that perhaps is missing in our company. What do you think uh, from your experience, what is the ratio of uh, enabling teams to stream aligned teams? Uh, that's a good question. It really, it depends a lot. So the enabling team, sometimes it's, they um, also, they come from gaps that we identify in the teams, but also sometimes from constraints we have. Um, because in some areas like uh, UX, for example, or um, product management, typically we have a small number of uh, people who have kind of, uh, who are experts or have more knowledge around this domain. So if we have these smaller teams of enabling uh, teams that can help a lot of the others kind of gain that knowledge, that can be quite, quite helpful. It's hard to give you um, a ratio um, because it really depends on what are the problems that your teams are facing. But essentially, if we're trying to move to streamline teams for uh, kind of build and run teams, Many organizations, those teams might lack understanding of how do I monitor, how do I, you know, uh, what is a good response, incident response approach, uh, all these sort of things. So you might need, they might need help around those aspects. Um, in other cases, they might need ha help with continuous delivery. So you kind of need to make an assessment of, um, there's actually um, uh, also um, uh, a tool that we have on GitHub, some simple tooling, there's a, an assessment of the cognitive load on teams, which is effectively trying to understand what are the sort of problems that they come up with frequently? What are the, the gaps that they have? Is it because they don't understand the, the operational side very well, or is it the, the testing side, or you know, what, what kind of problems they might have? Um, and so you need to kind of have that initial understanding, and then you can start having enabling teams, even just two people or something like that, um, some often people who are the experts in some domain that instead of that they are a dependency that we wait for them to do the work that they can help the other teams. Um, but it's, it's hard to give you um, a ratio. Maybe um, in your experience, um, is it um, good to, to mix responsibilities like to have a platform team that's also an enabling team? Is that advisable or is that a, an anti-pattern? No, it's actually, uh, we've seen that work quite well because effectively those teams are experts in the, the domain of the services that they provide, uh, like CICD. And so um, it, it, there's a, a third interaction mode that we call facilitating. Um, and so uh, that could, could um, be part of the platform team um, remit. The only thing to be careful is to, to not conflate the different interaction modes, right? If, if you have someone 
facilitating and trying to teach us another team and then they're on call and they have to go and, and fix a, and respond to an incident that's not going to be uh, mm. working very well. So inside the platform team, just make sure you have clear um, understanding of who is doing this enabling role and for how long and who is mm. working mm. on mm. developing the platform, who is on call, those sort of things. Mm. But it, so, it's a pattern that can mm. work quite well. Mm. So one last question. Um, what do you think about um, enabling teams? Are they more like a constant thing or can they be formed on an ad hoc basis and work for like a few months or weeks perhaps or? Yep, okay. can be both, can be short lived or long lived. Mm -hmm. This depends a bit on the domain of that you're trying to help. So kind of wider domains like architecture, or continuous delivery, perhaps you expect to have more long lived team. If you have a, a more specific domain, for example, I don't know, um, we had examples of, uh, if that, people may not be familiar with GDPR, but these are the data privacy regulations that came into the European Union. Some organizations had an enabling team uh, effectively to help this, the, the software delivery teams understand what you need to worry about in terms of how you store user data, how do you retrieve data, expose, et cetera. Um, and so the domain might be small enough Sometimes if you need external help, people, consultants or people from outside the organization, they could be, become a short-lived enabling team. So we have one case study in the book from ThoughtWorks uh, that they did just that. Um, so it can be both, depends on, on those a few factors. Okay, thank you, Manuel. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, for those of us who work for companies with the international reach, um, we are probably all quite familiar with GDPR, whether we like it or not. Um, yeah. in, in, uh, if you've got other questions, please drop them in the chat there. Uh, but uh, while folks think about what they want to ask, um, I have uh, one question, which is, in your experience, Manuel, what sort of blockers, what are the main blockers that you see for teams experimenting with these different team topologies? Um, <laughs> there are different blockers. Um, one of them is trying to... to if some some organizations have a, a lot of buy-in for team topologies, but then they're trying to have this sort of big reorganization, and that's something we we're not actually um, recommending. We're we're saying you know you were asking about enabling teams uh, before you know start small, start with one team or two teams, and see how this works. Uh, the platform you know many organizations already have a sort of platform team. Perhaps try to start. Um, in, in this kind of specific behavior that we talked about today um, with a few, you know, a small service or some new functionality that you start there and you're trying to establish those things and understand how these are going to help us before actually trying to map out the whole organization to the team topology. So that's, that's one of the challenges um, that we see. And the other is that um, having this clarity on interaction mode is actually quite unfamiliar for many people. And so when you're saying, well, we need more, more transparency on the way we're interacting, um, that's not always kind of uh, easy to, to start with. And that's again, why we should kind of start small and then you might start with a, um, one streamlined team and one enabling team and, and so on. And then you start sh showing how this uh, plays out in practice. Awesome. But we're, we're very much driven or many organizations driven by let's do let's change everything and now it's the right one and it's just that's not the way <laughs> it works <laughs> yeah very much so all right um last call for questions before we wrap up there's a great one there from dan in chat oh yeah um dan if you feel like i'm muting um feel free to do so otherwise um i'm happy to read it out Uh, yeah, thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, the product team, uh, the um, platform team seems like a product team. Uh, like, like any other delivery team, cross-functional, customer-focused, which is fantastic. But the enabling team, on the other hand, seems like a practice made up of experts, like sharing knowledge but working independently um, on different pieces of value. 
Um, is that the case? And if so, do you see that pattern mirrored in the architecture as Conway would suggest? Yes, um, that's a very good question. So effectively, uh, of course, for the presentation, we didn't have uh, enough time, but in the train, in the, some of the training we give, we actually, we talk about platform. Platform team is kind of an umbrella term, right? So effectively inside the platform, you would expect to see stream aligned teams where they, the service they, they're aligned to is things like CICD or monitoring or you know, infrastructure provisioning. So inside the platform, you actually would expect to align to independent services that the platform provides. Um, and this is effectively the architecture in, as, as well, right? We're talking about teams and architecture at the same time because of Conway's law. And it's the same thing we're trying to do outside the platform. We're trying to have streamlined teams where we're trying to identify, and that's also, and someone mentioned uh, monolith somewhere in the chat. Um, we're trying to identify what are the different independent services that we can have um, for our uh, product teams or streamlined teams so that they also are as independent as possible. If we want a loosely coupled um, system, then we also want loosely coupled teams. And so the two things, um, come together. So effectively inside the platform, we would expect to see similar sort of architecture and, and organization of the teams as outside the platform. So the enabling team functions differently though? Differently, yes. Yeah, so does that it, it also reflect in the system <coughs> topology? That's a good question. I'd something would be interesting to to explore i don't know if that can if you can say that reflects um i think to some extent it will reflect on if the enabling teams are helping uh if they so the enabling teams should be kind of orbiting around the streamline teams in the sense they should be helping different teams right but if it turns out that you know we're only often helping a subset of the teams then perhaps you start seeing that subset of teams making better uh, decisions around that domain. And so you might see that reflected in the, um, in the actual system. I don't know, I, I, it's something that would be interesting to, to explore. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Awesome, all right. Well, unless we've got any more questions. All right. We're going to wrap up there. I'm just going to drop the sharing just for a second. Um, just a yes, quick sir. thing before we finish up today. Um, last thing that we got here, uh, we've got our October meetup happening in two weeks from now. We've got two uh, great lightning talks lined up there. One from Toby Heat about upfront analysis with the Gantt chart visible from space. Toby's a very entertaining speaker. It'll be lovely to see him there uh, and share a bit of knowledge and wisdom with us. Um, and we've also got Dave McPherson uh, talking about why Square Cash moved from the test to TIDB, which uh, is going to be a pretty great talk as well. Uh, if you are interested in giving a talk in an upcoming meetup, uh, please feel free to hit us up through meetup. Uh, meetup, the messaging interface is uh, terrible for organizers, probably not that much better for attendees, uh, but we'll slog through it and we'll get you in there. Um, so even if you haven't given a talk before at a meetup uh, and you, uh, you want to do it from the comfort and safety of your own home in these COVID times, um, now is the opportunity for you to strike. All right, that is it. Uh, thanks, everyone. See you online in, uh, in the next couple of weeks and uh, stay safe. Awesome stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.